Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for asking me to present at your meeting this year. I'm just sorry that I can't be with you in person this time. So I'm going to talk about systemic lupus erythematosus, infection and COVID-19. So I'm going to start with a case presentation of a lady who presented in the last 18 months. I'll talk generally around infection and lupus, then COVID-19 and lupus, and then I'll touch on COVID-19 vaccination and immunosuppression. So if we start with the case, this lady, Mrs. SM, was a 47-year-old lady who'd been diagnosed with lupus at the age of 34, and she had fairly typical lupus at that point with inflammatory arthritis, serositis, ANA and double-stranded DNA antibody positive. She'd been stable for a number of years on azathioprine, 200 milligrams daily in divided doses, and low-dose prednisolone, 5 milligrams daily, alongside hydroxychloroquine. Things started to change in May of last year when she had a deterioration in her symptoms. She had increasing fatigue, she developed joint pain and some peripheral edema. And the blood test results at that time showed a strongly positive ANA, a rising titer of double-stranded DNA antibodies and a low C3 and C4. Her ESR was significantly elevated with a moderately elevated CRP. Her albumin creatinine ratio at that time was positive, was, um, elevated at 215 and her serum albumin was low at 18. So it was felt that she had had a systemic and a renal relapse and she went on to have a renal biopsy that showed evidence of vasculitic glomerular nephritis with diffuse proliferative lesions in keeping with class 4a disease. So at this point in time the UK was currently on the tail of the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic infections and it was really uncertain at this time as to the risk posed by immunosuppressants and severe COVID-19 disease. So it's a little bit difficult to determine what treatment we should go for next in this lady. But after discussion, it was decided to increase her prednisolone up to 30 milligrams daily and to switch her azathioprine over to mycophenolate mofetil, increasing the MMF up to one gram BD. And she did have some improvement in her symptoms and her proteinuria did increase coming down to 30. However, improvement was short-lived and by September, she was starting to deteriorate again. She had increased proteinuria once more with an ACR now rising to 250. She developed a new rash and she had shortness of breath with the chest X-ray showing some evidence of fluid overload and small bilateral pleural effusions. So by this time, she was on one gram TDS of MMF her prednisolone had been increased up to 20 milligrams daily. She continued on the hydroxychloroquine. She was requiring ramipril and doxazacin for her blood pressure and a torvastatin for hypercholesterolemia. So what would be our next steps in treatment here? We were really uncertain whether to go for cyclophosphamide. This is a tried and tested treatment for lupus nephritis, but it is significantly immunosuppressive. Will we go for rituximab? So this lady has failed on mycophenolate mofetil and has ongoing serious um, active disease, so would be eligible for rituximab according to UK protocols. Or should we try tacrolimus? So I don't have much experience of use of tacrolimus, but there are studies showing that it is helpful, particularly in renal lupus, often in combination with mycophenolate mofetil. So at this point in time, we were at the tail of the UK first wave of COVID-19 infections and COVID-19 cases were actually low in the UK. So a decision made was to, to treat this lady with rituximab. So in November, she re received two intravenous rituximab treatments two weeks apart. Her mycophenolate was reduced down to one gram BD and her prednisolone reduced down to 10 milligrams daily. And over the next two to three months, she did have a gradual improvement in symptoms with a reduction in her systemic symptoms and improvement in her shortness of breath. Her ACR and double-stranded DNA antibody levels fell and her C3 and C4 rose. So she had both a clinical and a serological improvement in her symptoms. And then in February and April, 2021, she received both doses of the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccines. And we were lucky in the UK that we had a very early rollout of vaccination 
And as she was considered clinically extremely vulnerable, she was called for vaccination in one of those early waves. Unfortunately, in June, things started to deteriorate. She presented to clinic with mild shortness of breath. She had no additional symptoms to suggest active SLE and a urine dipstick showed minimal proteinuria. A nasal swab from that day did show positive SARS-CoV-2 RNA detected, indicating that she had been infected with COVID-19. She had a respiratory review, and despite only feeling mildly short of breath, she was hypoxic with oxygen saturations of 92% on room air. She was therefore admitted. She was commenced on dexamethasone, six milligrams daily was, as was protocol, thromboprophylaxis, and a mycophenolate was paused. Unfortunately, she had a rapid deterioration and this was her chest X-ray around four days post admission. And as you can see, there's these fluffy infiltrates throughout both lung fields, which are indicative of COVID pneumonitis. She received intravenous tocilizumab as was protocol for severe disease. She had inotrope support, but unfortunately developed multi-organ failure and died approximately 10 days post admission. So this was a very sad case of a lady with active lupus who was immunosuppressed and sub subsequently succumbed to COVID-19 infection. So I'm going to go on to talk around infection in lupus generally, and then I'll move on to COVID-19. So this is a meta-analysis of uh, trials that have reported on infection rates in lupus. And this was pre-COVID era. era. So it found that infections are a major cause of morbidity and mortality in lupus with around 50% of patients experiencing a severe infection and a quarter of those will require hospitalization. Infection still accounts for around 25 to 50% of overall mortality in SLE. And over the last 20 years, it's been shown that it's serious rates of infection, rates of serious infection have been rising in the lupus cohorts. So why are lupus patients more at risk of infection? So this is a diagram of the immunopathology of lupus. And we know that there's abnormalities in both the innate and the adaptive immune response that lead to the development of autoimmunity. And a number of these abnormalities also confer an increased risk of infection. So we know that there are abnormalities in antigen presenting between dendritic cells and T cells. We know that there's abnormalities in the subsets of T cells and B cells that are produced in lupus patients that also increase the risk of infection. We know that complement levels are important, so complement deficiencies predispose to autoimmunity and also increase infection rates. And then abnormalities in macrophages and mononuclear cells can also increase the risk of infection and the development of autoimmunity. So there are a number of reasons in the immunopathology of lupus as to why these patients are also more at risk of infection. There's also a number of individual risk factors in lupus patients that predispose them to infection. So advancing age has been found to be a risk factor for infection. And we think this is why the rates of infection are actually rising in lupus cohorts. So as lupus patients are surviving longer, the age of the cohorts is increasing and this then increases the risk of infection. Active disease will increase the risk of infections, however you want to me measure that, but particularly if you have a high sleed eye or if you have a low C3. If you've had hematological involvement, so particularly if you've had low hemoglobin, low total white count or platelets, whether you've had previous nephritis or if you have serocytis will all predispose you to infection. So if we move on to the immunosuppressive drugs and infection in lupus. So the data is actually quite difficult to interpret here because lupus patients already have a number of risk factors why they may be developing infection. They're often on multiple drugs and those drugs may change. So it's quite difficult to determine which each individual drug, the risk that it in, imposes on increasing your risk of infection. What we do know is the majority are linked with an increased risk. So mycophenolate, azathioprine, and methotrexate have all been linked with an increased risk. However, we know that hydroxychloroquine is protective. So cohorts of patients who are on hydroxychloroquine actually have a lower rates of infection than those that are not. 
Now, I know that hydroxychloroquine does have a degree of an antiviral, antibacterial and anti-helminthic effect. So this is probably what's protecting the lupus patients who are on long-term hydroxychloroquine. Studies have also shown that tacrolimus has a minimal effect on increasing infection rates, even when it's used in combination with mycophenolate. And then studies have linked a number of drugs to the risk of developing serious infection. So the use of corticosteroids, the use of cyclophosphamide, and the use of rituximab for six months post-treatment with rituximab, or if you have more than three cycles. And this is a graph showing the relationship between corticosteroids and infection. So if you are on low dose corticosteroids, less than 7.5 milligrams daily, this doesn't seem to increase your risk of developing infection. However, if you're on more than 7.5 milligrams, your adjusted odds ratio of developing infection increases to 1.34. And if you're on more than 30 milligrams, that, that almost doubles up to 2.14. So corticosteroid doses are important um, with regard to infection rates. So what organisms are lupus patients tending to get infected with? So we know that the type of organism that they are infected with will vary according to environmental prevalence, so that will vary at different areas around the world. But around 80% of infections are bacterial, with 10% being viral and 2% being fungal. So this is a nice Korean cohort that uh, reported a couple of years ago. And the results are very similar to a Spanish cohort that just also reported recently. So in this cohort, they had 120 cases of infection. The vast majority of them were bacterial infections. And they were the infections that you would expect in the general population as well. So upper respiratory tract infections, pneumonia, urinary tract infections, GI infections, cellulitis. And the organisms that they're infected with, again, are ones that we see commonly within the general population. Mycobacterium infection was relatively high in this cohort at seven, and we'll talk a bit more about mycobacterium infection in the next slide. Fungal infection only occurred in three, and they only had one viral infection, which was varicella zoster. And varicella zoster is the commonest viral infection that you will find in lupus patients. <clears throat> so I'll just talk quickly about mycobacterium infection in lupus. So multiple studies have shown that there are increased rates of TB infection in lupus patients. So in endemic areas, the incidence of TB infection is around 5 to 7%, with latent TB incidence being up to 25%. We also know that TB in lupus tends to occur more frequently in the extrapulmonary sites, with the skin, the gut and the joints being the most common places. Patients are also at risk of non-tuberculous mycobacterium infection, what was previously called atypical mycobacterium. So it's recommended that if you're in an endemic area, that you should consider skin testing or T-spot testing patients, um, particularly if you're going to immunosuppress them and consider prophylactic treatment for their TB. And certainly in the UK, if we're going to use biologics, we will uh, do a T-spot test on all patients and a chest X-ray um, checking to see if there's evidence of latent TB and arrange for treatment if there is prior to the biologic therapy. And a major risk factor for the development of mycobacterium TB is the corticosteroids. So I'm just going to move on to talk about COVID-19 and lupus. So I took these figures um, from one of the world databases on COVID infections at the beginning of October. And at that time, there had been 237 million cases of COVID-19 reported. And these are only cases that have tested positive, so is a, a big underestimate of the actual number of cases that have occurred world war, worldwide. And at that point, there had been 4.8 million deaths from COVID reported. So the UK was hit hard with two major waves of infection. The first one in March, April of 2020, and the second one from November 2020 to, to March 2021. We have actually got a third wave going on now. Um, with around 40,000 cases a day, but thankfully the vaccination um, rates within the UK have kept the death rates low at the present. So this was the graph of deaths that occurred throughout the UK, and as we can see there was a peak in the April-May time with death rates occurring over a thousand for a number of days, and then again in the January, February, March time with high numbers of deaths occurring. <clears throat> 
So I think when the um, realization that the COVID-19 was going to be a pandemic affecting the whole world became evident that rheumatologists all around the world started to worry about their patients who were immunosuppressed and also their lupus patients were already more at risk of infection. And how much of a problem would COVID-19 be in this group of patients? So there were a couple of things that we felt may protect the lupus patients from severe COVID-19 disease. The fact that they're largely a female cohort, and we knew fairly early that severe COVID-19 was more prominent in male patients. Also in lupus patients, the type of inflammation they get is largely driven by type 1 interferons. Type 1 interferons do have an antiviral ac action, so it was postulated that this might help prevent severe COVID-19 in this group of patients. However, we knew there were a number of susceptibility factors. So patients were using corticosteroids, there was a large use of immunosuppressants, and a proportion of patients would have renal disease, and also the ethnic grouping in lupus patients. So we know that lupus is more severe in the Afro-Caribbean, African-American population, and some Asian populations. And these also were groups that were more at risk of severe COVID-19. So in the UK, clinically vulnerable patients were advised to shield by the UK government. And this basically main, involved remaining at home for a number of months, not having visitors to the house, being very careful of deliveries, um, coming into the house, et cetera. And what we know is that shielding was very effective in reducing infection in vulnerable groups. So we didn't know for a long period of time whether COVID-19 was going to be more severe in lupus patients, because actually the public health measures that were put into place reduced the infection in that group to very low levels. But now multiple observational studies are reporting on COVID-19 in lupus. And what they're tending to show is that the morbidity and mortality in lupus patients mirrors the general population. So, it so this tends to occur in the older age group, male sex, those with renal disease, cardiac disease, and certain ethnic groupings. Hydroxychloroquine doesn't appear to have a protective effect in either preventing the development of symptomatic COVID or the development of serious disease. Now, as we all know, hydroxychloroquine's had a checkered history with regard to COVID-19. Initially, it was thought that it may be helpful and actually supplies became quite short for our patients as they were diverted to be used for prophylaxis of COVID and for treatment of symptomatic disease. But studies in the general population didn't find it was of benefit and now that seems to be borne out in the lupus populations, there doesn't appear to be a protective effect. And interestingly, the immunosuppressive drugs didn't appear to affect the outcome from COVID infection, although there is data for an adverse effect with both corticosteroids and some emerging evidence for rituximab. So this is one of the big cohorts in Europe that has reported recently. So this involved all rheumatology patients so it's not just lupus patients, but uh, across the whole spectrum of rheumatological disease. And this was looking at rates of COVID-19 and hospitalization. And these are adjusted odds ratios. And as you can see, those traditional risk factors that we knew from the general population incre increased your risk of uh, severe COVID hold true in the rheumatoid population. So the older age, hypertension, lung disease, diabetes, and renal impairment. DMARDs did not seem to increase your risk of serious disease. And if anything, biologic DMARDs and particularly TNFs may reduce your risk of serious disease. With corticosteroids, a dose of between one to 10 milligrams daily did not appear to have an effect on your risk of serious infection. However, above 10 milligrams, this did increase your risk of severe COVID-19 and hospitalization. So what I would say around immunosuppressants of COVID-19 is that timing is, is everything. So it, it doesn't look that chronic use of immunosuppression did increase the risk of severe COVID-19 disease and possibly was helpful in some cases. But we do know that if you develop the hyperinflammatory syndrome of COVID infection approximately 10 days post primary infections, then some biologists can improve your outcome. So this is obviously a different mechanism than to the primary infection this is more of an autoimmune hyperinflammatory syndrome. So we know that dexamethasone that's used at this point can be helpful. And also the IL-6 inhibitors 
um, in patients that are providing, providing, who are requiring oxygen therapy, it can be helpful. And there are ongoing studies looking at other biologics, particularly the JAK kinase inhibitors. So if we move on to rituximab. So we already had concerns with rituximab and um, infections. So we know that B cell depletion is, is with rituximab is long lasting and that B cells only re reach pretreatment levels at around nine to 12 months post-treatment. We already knew that there was a significant risk of chronic viral reactivation, particularly hepatitis B virus and JC virus. And it looks like our concerns around rituximab have been borne out. So an observational study in France looking at around a thousand patients treated with rituximab across all conditions. So these were patients with rheumatoid arthritis, vasculitis, lupus, but also hematological patients who were receiving rituximab for the hematological conditions. Showed that there was an increased risk of severe COVID-19 infection in this group of patients, increased mortality and hospitalizations within six months of rituximab use. And this again is the, a French study just looking at rheumatoid patients. So uh, rheumatology patients, so these are patients with rheumatoid arthritis, vasculitis and lupus. And what this shows that in the rituximab group, there was a higher instance of moderate or severe disease. Patients had longer hospitalizations and there was a higher percentage of deaths than in the non-treated group, although this didn't reach significance. But that's probably due to the low numbers of deaths that occurred. So rituximab does look to be of concern with COVID-19 infections. So what about vaccination and COVID and rituximab? So we already know from a number of studies that have looked at influenza and pneumococcal vaccine, that vaccine responses are blunted for around six months post rituximab treatment. And there are some studies now showing that immunization with COVID-19 vaccine within three months of rituximab is associated with lower antibodies to COVID-19 spike protein indicating again that there is a lower response to the COVID vaccine. And this is a uh, article that's recently been published in Rheumatology, which is outlining key therapeutic considerations when vaccinated against COVID-19, along standing DMARDs and biologic therapies. So this is not specific to lupus, this is across all rheumatology patients. And the recommendations are that you should avoid vaccination during disease flares. You should taper steroid therapy to less than 10 milligrams daily. You should consider withholding methotrexate for two weeks post-vaccination. And you should ideally avoid vaccinating for six months post-rituximab. Post and what it's saying is if you have insufficient time to alter or amend the DMARD or biologic therapy, then you should go ahead with vaccination but you should assess vaccine response at a later date. And this is really by measuring the spike antibodies to see whether a patient has developed them. So if we go back to Mrs. SM, so she had a number of risk factors for development of severe COVID. She had multi-system lupus, although at the time when she contracted COVID, she had moderate to low disease activity. She did have renal disease, she was on prednisolone, 10 milligrams daily, and she had rituximab. She actually had it seven months prior to the infection, but I'm sure this was a factor in her developing severe disease. She had been vaccinated about COVID, but that had been within three months of her rituximab. So it's likely that she had a poor response to her vaccination. So if I knew then what I knew now, what would I have done differently with this patient? So I think I would have considered tacrolimus instead of rituximab because it is not so uh, associated with severe infection and obviously with the rituximab's long mechanism of action we had that long period after where she was susceptible. I think I would have tried to reduce her steroid dose faster but this is always difficult in lupus patients. They feel well on corticosteroids and it is a struggle to get doses down but in the current landscape with COVID-19 we should all be trying to get steroid doses as low as possible. And she would have received a third primary COVID vaccination. So all clinically vulnerable patients in the UK have been called for a third primary dose of COVID-19 vaccination to try and boost their antibody response. 
Once she was infected with COVID-19, then we would have checked her COVID-19 spike protein antibodies. We could have, and if they were negative, then we could have considered treatment with Ronaprive. Now, Ronaprive is a newly approved drug for the treatment of antibody negative patients who are clinically vulnerable for COVID-19. This is a combination of two monoclonal antibodies that bind to the spike protein on the COVID-19 virus and prevent it entering the host cells. And it has been found to re reduce the incidence of severe disease and death in this group of patients. So this would have been a therapeutic option that would have been available to her now. So thank you very much for listening to my talk. I've discussed around a case of a very unfortunate lady who contracted COVID-19 and subsequently died, and then around general infections and then also COVID-19 in uh, the lupus population. So thank you very much and I wish you all the best for the rest of the day.